When America was in flames, some of the heat was directed at the police. Many cities cut or lost cops. How many officers are you down right now? Right now we're down about 400 officers. We go to a place being called Cop City and take a look at the future of law enforcement. Do you think that we're seeing a pendulum swing from that defund movement back to a refund movement? Are U.S. college protest against Israel's action in Gaza fueled by a foreign source? There needs to be a federal investigation into the funding of our universities. We follow the money from Qatar to American universities. Americans are dying at an unexpectedly alarming rate. It's like a 9-11 every day because our health and health care has become so inferior to the other countries. To achieve that inferior health, we're spending more than twice as much as the other countries uh, on a per person basis each year. This week, we follow the money to find a disturbing divide between patience and profit. Welcome to Full Measure. I'm Cheryl Ackeson. In 2021, calls to defund the police became familiar across America. New York City cut more than $300 million. Millions were slashed from law enforcement in Baltimore, Maryland, Portland, Oregon, and Minneapolis, Minnesota, where a black suspect named George Floyd was killed after a police encounter. But a lot has happened since. There's been an alarming rise in crime and backlash from residents worried about safety. In Atlanta, Georgia, after briefly considering slashing the police budget, they went in the opposite direction, green lighting a $90 million public safety training center for policing. But Scott Thuman reports it sparked violence by protesters who have dubbed it Cop City. Just go in there and say, hey, check me, you guys, get some gas, and if things are right, any concerns, any issues, problems with loitering, that sort of thing. Early evening roll call at Atlanta's Zone 4 Police District. A strain on resources means longer shifts and longer waits for people to get help, explains Captain Thomas Aitzer. Our response time is getting bigger and bigger because we just don't have as many officers to get those calls as quickly. Back in the day, five, six years ago, when we were fully staffed, well, it was no big deal. You're talking about call response time was seconds to, to minutes because everybody was here and then you'd have that umbrella car. And now there's really that just, delay to get to Now the there's a delay. Yeah. Does it look damaged? Or yeah. It like, is damaged? It looked like somebody broke into the house. Okay. Policing in Atlanta, Georgia has never been busier and in some ways never more challenged. Atlanta police, make yourself known if you're inside. Just look at the numbers. 170 murders last year, the city's highest total since 1996. So far this year, the statistics are better, but the city remains desperate for more cops. How many officers are you down right now? Right now we're down about 400 officers. Darren Shirebaum is chief of the Atlanta Police Department. We're authorized about 2035 is what we're authorized at, and we, we need 400 to get back to that point. We're still the largest law enforcement agency in the state, uh, but we want to be back to that, to that full authorized strength because guess what? In 2026, we're hosting the World Cup, a significant portion of it right here in our city, and we have to be ready for that. These demonstrators came here ready to confront the police. But the police are working against a background of heightened scrutiny and growing distrust. Atlanta, like many cities, faced protests and calls to cut back its police department in 2020 after nationwide protests against policing. In Austin, Texas, the council went so far as to cut $150 million from the police budget. New York City officials cut $1 billion in 2020. And in Minneapolis, where George Floyd died, the city council called to replace police with a new Department of Public Safety, though voters rejected that move. In the last two years, rising levels of crime across the nation have silenced most of the calls to defund, as murders went up 30% in 2020. But attracting new officers has never been harder. When it comes to training, this is what for years Atlanta recruits had to work with. An old school building turned police academy 
with peeling paint. This is not exactly state of the art, what we're walking through. That wasn't state of the art when we moved in in the 90s either. It was supposed to be a, a temporary location in the 90s. So city and law enforcement leaders came up with a $90 million plan to turn training around, and they're turning soil to do it at a site just outside Atlanta. But can you imagine people out here riding their horses with the mounted patrol through the trails? Yeah. Former Secret right. Service right. agent Dave Wilkinson leads Atlanta's Police Federation, an independent group tied to local businesses that's helping to push and pay for the center. If you really want to put people out on the street, that is police officers or firefighters or paramedics, and you want them to be in life-saving roles, you have to make sure they are properly trained. If you want to prevent the events of police brutality that you've seen around the country, and you want to make sure Atlanta isn't the next big story, you make sure you have doubled down on your effort to train your police officers to make sure they understand the laws of the state of Georgia, they are comfortable in their uniform every day, they know how to de-escalate a situation, and ultimately make good decisions. But what he sees as a state-of-the-art opportunity, others see as a threat. Protesters dubbed the training center Cop City, depicting it as little more than an excuse to further militarize policing in their city. Kamal Franklin is a community activist and one of the leading voices against the project. What are your biggest concerns? What are your biggest problems with what you've called Cop City? I think our biggest concerns is that Cop City is basically a reaction to the demonstrations and organizings that happened after 2020 when Rashard Brooks was killed here in Atlanta, Breonna Taylor was killed, George Floyd was killed. This to us seems to be a reaction to that because some of the things that have been planned for this site include urban warfare training, paramilitary grade facilities, mock cities for, for crowd control. So you think race is a big part of this? I think race is a huge part of this. Just because it was a black administration, it doesn't mean we can let them get away with continuing to over-police our communities. During a series of protests this year, demonstrators broke into the site, destroying construction equipment, setting vehicles on fire, and shooting commercial-grade fireworks at officers. Are you okay with some of the more extreme tactics that have been used in opposition to uh, what you call Cop City? I'm okay with the tactics that have been used to stop Cop City because no one talks about the police violence that actually started this situation as violence. It is the police killings which started this, this situation. In January, a raid by state police on a Stop Cop City encampment led to gunfire. One officer was shot and wounded. One protester, environmental activist Manuel Tehran, was killed by police. While Atlanta's mayor and a majority of the council have voted to push the training center plan forward, opponents have gathered thousands of signatures calling for a vote this fall on whether to scrap it. Do you think that we're seeing a pendulum swing from that defund movement that was so loud in many cities across the country back to a refund movement? Here's what I know. It doesn't matter how you voted in the last election. It doesn't matter who you are, where you were raised. You want to be protected. You want to go to your parks and not be assaulted. You want to be able to come across any city and not have your property stolen. And you want to feel safe as you go about and enjoy the community that is home for you. And that remains the same. And so while there may be a period of time where individuals said, what is the role of the police in the country? I think we're seeing now that people understand that a quality constitutional committed police department is good for everybody, and it's good for the democracy, and it's good for any community, regardless of how they voted in the last election. But to be clear, you don't want to get rid of police. No, to be clear, I would get rid of the police. You would? Yeah. I think the problem is, is that we think the police solve crime. Mm -hmm. There's no statistical evidence whatsoever that shows the ways in which police solve The police react to crime, right? The police may make arrests. But the police are not the things that make our communities safe. The safest communities in this country are communities with resources. Wilkinson thinks the majority of people are now firmly behind the police again. Crime, it was very predictable. Attack on the police is going to lead to higher level of crimes. So it's equally as predictable when crime rates started to go up, the residents of any city come together and say, we have got to support the police. So I would argue, or I would say, that right now we see a higher level of support for police than I've seen in all my years of doing this. 
A lot of people predicted that, like you say. What, what are other cities and states doing that are in the same boat? Well, there's been a realization that as crime rates go up, there is a need for more and better trained officers. And there are training facilities that are being built or have already opened in places like Texas, Maryland, California, and elsewhere. But recruitment really still is the challenge. And a recent survey found that a lot of departments keep losing officers faster than they can hire them. New York City, for example, still cutting some of the size of its force and citing budget cuts. We'll keep watching this. Thanks a lot, Scott. Coming up, we follow the money to learn who's supporting anti-Semitism on America's college campuses. In the wake of the Islamic extremist terrorist attacks on Israel, there's been a rise in anti-Jewish hate here in the U.S., particularly on some college campuses. A new report finds anti-Semitism in higher education is being stoked by a foreign government that's quietly become a major funder of our universities. Federal investigations have been opened into Harvard University, the New York City Department of Education, and seven other entities amid complaints of anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. Good morning. University leaders were called to testify at a hearing this past week. Harvard President Claudine Gay. We have seen a dramatic and deeply concerning rise in anti-Semitism around the world, in the United States, and on our campuses, including my own. Charles Small heads up the Institute for the Study of Global Anti-Semitism and Policy, a group following the money when it comes to anti-Semitism in higher education. We've learned that funding by Qatar in particular uh, has influenced American academia when it comes to issues of democracy, the West, the notion of America, American society, in the United States in the world, and when it comes to the Jew Jewish people in Israel. And basically Qatar, uh, its, its spiritual leaders of the Qatari royal family is the Muslim Brotherhood. A series of investigative reports by Small's group points to the Muslim nation of Qatar, a key supporter of the terrorist group Hamas and the biggest foreign funder of American universities. Can you explain what Qatar's special interest might be in undermining the West and promoting this idea of anti-Semitism? So basically the Muslim Brotherhood wants to destroy Israel and they're Islamists and they believe all of the Islamic world has to be under control of uh, Islamist ideology. They want to create a caliphate. They want to get rid of Western interests, Christians, Jews, moderate Muslims who don't believe in their ideology and replace it with a, an extremist caliphate and in doing so weaken the West. A crucial facet of Qatar's funding of American universities is a massive facility near Qatar's capital dubbed Education City. Since 2003 we've built a marketplace of ideas where East meets West. Education City hosts on-site campuses in Qatar for Texas A&M, Georgetown, Cornell, Northwestern, Virginia Commonwealth University, and Carnegie Mellon. I am a Northwestern graduate. I'm John Matt Georgetown, Carnegie Mellon University. Small says Qatar's contract with Texas A&M is especially concerning. Texas A&M University is proud to support the Qatar National Vision 2030. Texas A&M has access to two nuclear reactors for teaching and research. The school has accepted more than a billion dollars from Qatar for more than 500 research projects, including sensitive nuclear research. We know that Hamas, their leadership lives in Qatar and is supported by the Qatari regime. Are they sharing some of this military secrets or research with them? In 2019, Small's group unearthed $3 billion in foreign money that American universities failed to report. That's against the law. A federal investigation that followed identified at least $6.5 billion in undocumented money to U.S. colleges from Qatar, Islamist organizations, Russia, and China. Was there any punishment when the universities were found to have taken the money without the proper reporting? Unfortunately, not yet. Um, as soon as the, this current administration was elected, they called off the, the federal investigation. The Institute for the Study of Global Anti-Semitism and Policy now recommends banning direct Qatari government funding to U.S. universities, 
closing American campuses in Education City and any programs funded through illicit means, and criminal action against those who broke the law by failing to report foreign donations. Harvard's president was asked about $19 million from Qatar. Do you think Harvard should be accepting money from countries that support terrorists? Again, we have strict policies that govern the gifts and contracts that we accept. But we do you have comply a personal fully opinion? with federal law, and we will not accept gifts that do not align with our mission. Cornell, Yale, and Texas A&M declined to answer our questions about Qatar money and hate against Jews. Yale told us the anti-Semitism report contains errors, is misleading, and that its Qatar funding has been properly reported. Cornell says it's proud of its collaboration, over $1.3 billion from Qatar to operate a medical school there and for medical and scientific research. What do you think should happen next? There needs to be a federal investigation into the funding of our universities and the hijacking of our education by anti-democratic, anti-American, hateful organizations. The Biden administration says it's developing cooperative agreements with campus police to identify and punish anti-Semitic crime. When we come back, an alarming but little discussed health crisis, Americans are suddenly dying younger. For all the trillions we spend on health care each year, there's an underreported scandal in America impacting all of us. Life expectancy has taken a sharp dive, and our death rate is trending in the wrong direction, up, not down. Today, we explore what's wrong with Dr. John Abramson, a family doctor and faculty member at Harvard Medical School, where he teaches health care policy. His newest eye-opening book is Sickening, How Big Pharma Broke American Health Care and How We Can Repair It. To what factors do you attribute what I think could be called corruption inside the industry slash government on these issues? If we believe that the function of uh, the pharmaceutical industry and the biotech industry is to do science that's competently uh, set up and analyzed and transparent and peer-reviewed transparently and published in journals so doctors can read about the best way to take care of their patients, if that's what we expect, it's corruption. And the public isn't understanding this because their job is to maximize the money that gets returned to the investors. And until we just accept that, stop believing all the ads that they're there to save us and stop grandma from getting dementia and so forth and so on, we've got to stop believing that because their job is to make money and they're going to play that game just like professional athletes play their game, except there aren't many referees in the biotech and pharma industry like there are referees in professional sports. Dr. Abramson says he wants to wake up Americans to some alarming health trends. First, while people in comparable countries are living longer, the U.S. has seen the opposite trend. American life expectancy showed a uniquely sharp drop in 2020 and 2021, bottoming out at age 76 and recovering only to 77 and a half in 2022. The low point was the worst since 1996, with people in Japan and Switzerland living about eight full years longer. Meantime, American taxpayers are spending a lot more to achieve the poor results. The U.S. spends more than double the average on health care, nearly $13,000 per person a year. That's way more than Japan, where they lived eight and a half years longer in 2021. And finally, the U.S. death rate. In the 1980s, things were good. 50,000 fewer Americans were dying than expected compared to other wealthy countries. But fast forward to 2021 and things devolved dramatically. We're so much worse than the other countries that 1.1 million Americans are dying each year in excess of the rates of death in the other countries. So that's 3,000 Americans are dying every day. It's like a 9-11 every day because our health and health care has become so inferior to the other countries. To achieve that inferior health, we're spending more than twice as much as the other countries um, uh, on a per person basis each year. And the excess that we're spending is $2.3 trillion, 
which is more than the annual federal budget deficit in the United States. So we've got this budget deficit that's crippling our country, both politically and economically, and it's to achieve far inferior health care. This makes no sense. An implication of what you've said is not only that the more money we've spent, it hasn't helped, but the more money we've spent, it may be hurting. Is it having an impact to hurt the health of our citizens as we've spent more money? The evidence shows that. The reason why this is, um, dysfunction is stable is that the, everything that the doctors read is talking about the benefit of new drugs. So 96% of our research dollars go to studying new drugs and devices, and only 4% of our research dollars go to figure out, figuring out how to make people healthier and provide better health care. So doctors, their job is to stay up with the current knowledge and read the journals and know what evidence-based medicine is. Well, 96% of that evidence is about new drugs and devices, but only 20% of our health has to do with health care. The doctors are trained to think that all of being a good doctor has to do with incorporating the latest technology into their practice, and they don't understand that this is just where the most money is uh, going to be found. Is it reasonable to assume this is by design? I think the question is, is it a conspiracy or a confluence of interest? I don't think that there's a plan to make people less healthy and make more money because they're less healthy. I think there's a confluence of interest that we, we being the biotech industries and pharma industries, can extract the most money by having the healthcare system function like this. And the result is terrible health. So I think the problem is that this is the way the game is played by the executives in the biotech industries. Their job is to maximize the financial return to their stockholders. And if the federal uh, budget um, gets hurt, and if Americans' health gets hurt, that's just collateral damage. Though some blame the U.S. excess deaths and drop in life expectancy on COVID, it doesn't explain why other countries hit hard by COVID didn't experience similar trends. And the U.S. is among the countries most vaccinated against COVID. After a break, what's ahead next week on Full Measure? Coming up next week on Full Measure, parents are raising their voices like never before, demanding they be able to use student funds to send their child to the school of their choice. So families like ours, we don't have time to wait for reform. We want to put our children in the best educational environment now. The push for open enrollment and why it's not always succeeding next week on Full Measure. Until then, we'll be searching for more stories that hold powers accountable. Thanks for watching. I'm Cheryl Ackerson.